Hi, everyone. This is Olga Redding with iOrganic Association. Welcome everyone to our Valent Biosciences webinar today. I'm excited you guys uh, uh, yeah. take time out of your day to be here. What I would um, suggest, if you don't mind guys, uh, muting yourself for the time being. Um, and then uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll plan to have about um, 10 minutes of Q&A where you can actually unmute yourself and ask questions. However, if there are questions that come up while um, um, Daniel is speaking, feel free to enter them into our chat box and um, I will keep track of them and I will ask them of Daniel at the end of, our, of, at the end of his presentation. Um, so what we'll do here, we'll give it a couple more minutes for more people to trickle in um, and I'll probably get started with my uh, quick presentation here at around 12.05 and then after that Daniel will start and then um, as I mentioned at the end we'll have about um, 10 minutes for Q&A. Thanks everyone for being here today. And the good news, you guys, this meeting is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, if you'd prefer to review it again at a later time, uh, or if you'd prefer to share it with anyone that could benefit from this information. Okay, so we'll give it just a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. Excellent. Okay, guys. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so for those of you who don't know me already, my name is Olga Redding and I am the Education Outreach Coordinator for Iowa Organic Association. And uh, we are excited to have Valen Bion Sciences for a webinar today. Um, uh, Dr. Daniel will speak more about their uh, products and um, various options that you can incorporate in your organic systems plan. However, in the meantime, I'll just briefly share um, a little bit about Iowa Organic Association. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that has been established in 2006. Uh, we are based here in Iowa. Our mission is to advance organic agriculture and food systems in Iowa. And our members represent a diverse community of Iowa's organic farmers, gardeners, food, food and farm businesses, and anyone and everyone that wants to advocate for organic. So thank you guys for being part of this webinar and for supporting our work. As far as our priorities, uh, our four overarching priorities are listed here. They include education, outreach, advocacy, and community. Um, my primary focus is on education and outreach. Um, and, and as far as that's concerned, uh, what we have done over the last few years is we've um, uh, created these uh, uh, workshops called Growing Organic Expertise Workshops. We've delivered them to various um, organizations like NRCS and FSA folks uh, have heard from us regarding that. We also created the Midwest Organic Core Conference that ended up being canceled in 2020 due to COVID. And then uh, the most recent um, uh, endeavor uh, with our education has been uh, this grant that we received from Iowa Department of Natural Resources, REAP-SEP grant is the abbreviated version. Um, and with this grant, we have been able to uh, go to 10 different colleges across the state of Iowa and um, do lectures at these colleges about organic agriculture. So alongside me, an organic farmer would join me and share their stories and the reason why they became organic. And what's really exciting, you guys, is we are actually 
uh, we reapplied for this grant one more time and we received it again. So we will be continuing this work one for one more year. And I am partnering with uh, seven new colleges and three colleges that we've worked with last year. So that's pretty cool. As far as, far as outreach is concerned, uh, you know, we connect with target audience and the public to promote research, events, resources, and anything that may ben be beneficial to the organic community. We're always part of various conferences and trade shows and community events. Um, you can find all of the uh, happenings on our website. Um, definitely join our e-news if you're not on there already. And then our calendar is a huge resource. We post our events and then any other organization events that could be helpful. Um, we're also active on social media. Give us a follow there. And um, always happy to interact via our listserv. As far as advocacy is concerned, we have been working with state level leadership, um, trying to help uh, with some of those policies. Um, you know, we've met with Secretary Nag uh, last year, and we are um, keeping our conversation open with him this year as well. As far as community, uh, you know, we encourage a culture of collaboration by connecting organic experts stakeholders and resources to strengthen our Iowa's organic community. And you guys are part of that community. So thank you for all you do. Um, as far as resources are concerned, a pretty big resource that I would encourage you to check out on our website. It is available in PDF format. You can download directly to your desktop. Or if you'd like a copy of this a document in paper format, I'm more than happy to mail one your way. Uh, it's this organic resource directory um, that includes over 900 businesses, nonprofits, educators, and service providers that can be of use and a resource to you and your organic operation. Uh, we believe that this uh, directory serves as a valuable tool for Iowa's organic community to achieve growth and continued success. And then, of course, as a nonprofit organization, we rely heavily on your support. Um, if you're not already a member, if you'd like to consider becoming one, uh, definitely connect with myself or Roz. We're here to uh, help answer any questions um, and are grateful for all of your support. So this is what I have. And I'll actually go ahead and uh, let Daniel uh, talk about his presentation. So Daniel, if you wanna go ahead, that'd be great. All right, thank you so much. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yep, okay, great. Okay. So uh, thank you all for, uh, for, for joining us today. Um, today, I'd like to talk about um, 50 years of sustainable crop protection with uh, Dipel and Zentari biological insecticides. Uh, so my name is Daniel Zamek. I'm the technical development specialist for the Biorational Crop Protection Group at Valen Biosciences. Um, before we got started, I did wanna just explain the difference between Valen Biosciences and uh, Valen, the uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, the distributor that sells our products um, uh, across the country. Uh, so Valent Biosciences uh, is part of the Valent Group of Companies, which is a subsidiary of Sumitomo Chemical. Yeah. And so we sell uh, our uh, Valent Biosciences manufacturers and sells these commercial formulations around the world uh, through Sumitomo Chemical distribution uh, in really the majority of, of countries where we can, over 60 countries worldwide. And so today um, I'm, I'm talking to you from Valent Biosciences. However, uh, if you want to reach out to someone local, uh, find a sales rep or even a, a location where you can purchase these products, um, then I would, um, I would point you to valent.com slash find the rep. And there's a really great resource there where you can find um, who your local sales rep is to call and ask questions or, or get in contact with other um, technical specialists. <clears throat> So at Valent Biosciences, um, our mission is to reimagine agriculture, forestry, and public health through the power of fermentation and microbiology. And Dipel and Centauri are very much um, a core 
to that, to that objective. Um, the strains of Bacillus thuringiensis used in Dipel uh, have been used in agriculture for now more than 50 years, uh, not only in agriculture, but also uh, in protecting uh, our national forests. Um, other, other products uh, produced by Valent Biosciences are also used in protecting public health um, through mosquito control and um, uh, other, uh, other disease vectors. <clears throat> And so today, uh, I, I'm uh, glad to share that we're actually celebrating uh, 50 years of Dipel uh, being available in the United States. Uh, first registered in 1971. Uh, last year marks 50 years in the marketplace. Now, it's, I think it's really important to, to take a minute and, and really note the longevity of, uh, of these commercial BTs. Because if you look back at what, um, what agrochemicals were commonly used 50 years ago, um, it looks entirely different than what we see today. I'm really going to show that these, these biologicals uh, like BT were very much a technology ahead of their time. Uh, while they may have been commonly used early on as new agrochemicals came along, they may have lost favor, uh, would, would, um, would sort of gain favor once uh, resistance or, or other issues arose. And now today we, we find um, an agriculture market that looks very different than it did 50 years ago, with an emphasis more on sustainability of uh, ensuring you know, minimal um, impact to the environment and a greater demand than ever for um, organic, uh, organic produce. So the story of history of Dipel begins way back in the 1900s when uh, BTs were first discovered uh, in Japan and then rediscovered and renamed uh, in Germany. Uh, the first commercial product actually was sold in 1938. So BTs have been on the market for, um, for more than 80 years. Now, back in uh, 1958 was the first commercial BT uh, used in the U.S. It wasn't Dipel. Uh, we weren't the first, uh, but we're definitely uh, one of the longest in the market today. And actually, interestingly enough, it wasn't even discovered uh, what the active ingredient was, these uh, insecticidal uh, cry proteins that I'll talk more about later, uh, until the 1950s. So for 50 years, these products were being used um, uh, in agriculture without really even knowing uh, what, how they worked. So then in 1970, the Dipel brand name was registered for the first time. And in 1971, uh, Dipel was first registered with the EPA. And uh, a little interesting anecdote here, if you look on the bottom right-hand corner, this is a paper uh, from the Journal of Invertebrate Pathology. Uh, the author here, um, Howard Dolmage, was an entomologist with uh, the USDA out of Brownville, Texas. And um, Howard, uh, or Dr. Dolmage kept a colony of um, a bollworm that he would use for his research. And um, I guess the story goes that there was an outbreak of some kind of uh, bacterial disease in the colony that was really affecting, um, affecting the insects. And he isolated that, uh, he isolated that, that, um, that bacterial disease and uh, referred to it as the HD1 strain. And this HD1 is really the basis for the majority of commercial BTs that you'll find in the market. So the, uh, the ABTS351 strain found in Dipel came from this original isolate, um, uh, uh, isolated back in the, uh, the 1960s. So uh, this, this history is very rich and um, there's just a lot of interesting people along the way. So in 2000, uh, Sumitomo Chemical acquired uh, the Abbott um, Agrochemical Division of Abbott Laboratories. So 1971, that registration was actually under Abbott Laboratories. Uh, and with that acquisition, they inherited the BT portfolio. And now we find ourselves today uh, in, um, in, in 2022, now 51 years after uh, Dipel was first launched in the United States. And um, uh, the, really the spread uh, of, um, of Dipel has really uh, expanded well beyond, uh, well beyond the US border. So today, Dipel uh, is registered in more than 60 countries around the world. Um, I have here some examples of, I don't know, some interesting logos uh, that, that I could find. The one in the bottom left here is a, um, uh, this is one of our logos from Latin America. Uh, the one in the middle is from Spain. Uh, the, the one in the top there with the very, very long uh, description of uh, water dispersible granule is our, uh, I believe that's our German uh, logo. And then the bottom right-hand corner uh, is, a, is a logo from Thailand. I mean, just to really show that 
Uh, it started in the United States, but then uh, Dipel has since spread really around the world. And it's probably one of the most well-recognized brands of commercial BTs uh, on the market. Now, of course, in the US, the Dipel DF and Zentari DF formulations are only listed. However, um, we have organic certifications, for example, um, EU organic certification uh, in, in most countries uh, around the world. A lot of them will have their own, uh, their own specific local uh, um, organic certifications. And so, uh, you know, for uh, as of today, we, we have those organic certifications um, really anywhere in the world that we need them. So these products are really grown to those um, very specific standards that meet the, the uh, that not only meet the quality needs that you you really need for an effective BT product, but also for um, uh, meeting those organic standards. Now, Dipel and Zentari are made from the BT microbes. These are natural microbes that are ubiquitous in the environment. And the active ingredient, so what really makes up Dipel uh, and Zentari is this broth made from fermentation. Here's an example from one of our laboratories. And uh, you know, we grow it a heck of a lot like uh, you would grow beer uh, or something like that uh, in these massive 100,000 liter uh, fermenters. So that beer is then concentrated and dried and formulated into the product that, that you see um, out on the farm. And so I mentioned this because uh, commercial BTs are really interesting, uh, are really interesting because there's just so much to them. I mean, we essentially have here this bacterial disease of caterpillars that we can use, um, that we can use very effectively to control uh, lepidopteran pests. And so it comes with this very complex, multifaceted mode of action. On the left-hand side here is an image of a, uh, a BT cell. So here we have the viable spore. That's kind of synonymous with a seed, the survival structure of the microbe. And then here uh, is a insecticidal crystal protein. Uh, that protein is, that's really the, the tip of the spear uh, for Dipo and Zentari. These crystal or cry proteins um, will, are produced at such high quantity and at such purity in the BTs that they'll naturally crystallize in the cell. And this is, again, the primary mode of action which forms pores in the caterpillar midgut. Now, viable spores uh, are also there. They'll germinate in the insect gut. They won't germinate in the plant or in the bottle. This helps to kill the insect, but it, does not, uh, it is not toxic in and of itself. So having spores out in the environment doesn't, um, doesn't help you in the long term. Now, BTs also produce a lot of soluble synergists and other byproducts like VIP3A. Uh, this is a vegetative insecticidal protein that looks a whole lot like a cry protein, has a similar mode of action, but has very unique target sites. And it doesn't crystallize like the cry protein. There's also secondary metabolites that can synergize cry proteins, like uh, PD100 or other, other enzymes that can help do the job. So there's a lot that goes on in a commercial BT. And so for that reason, um, the strain really has an important impact on how effective that product is going to be, how effective that BT is going to be in the field, and against which particular insect. And that really starts with um, the crytoxin profile. Now, anyone who has any experience with, um, uh, with genetically modified crops um, will sort of recognize some of these proteins as being those that are very effectively used in cotton, corn, soybean, to um, effectively control caterpillar pests. And those proteins came out really straight out of um, our commercial, these commercial BT strains. Um, they're really so effective that they're, they're used wherever possible. Now, in the case of Dipel, uh, we have four unique uh, individual cry proteins, the cry1AA, 1AB, 1AC, and then the unique cry2A, cry2A type proteins. So, um, each of these proteins can uh, bind to a different receptor site in the caterpillar gut, which gives them sort of this uh, an additional um, layer of uh, multifaceted mode of action. <clears throat> now, Zentari, on the other hand, is a uh, what's called a BT subspecies Azali type strain. This strain contains the Cry1AA and 1AB that's found in Dipel, but uniquely has Cry1C and 1D. Uh, that are actually more effective against a specific caterpillar species. Again, each of these cryproteins can bind to a unique receptor site in the caterpillar gut. 
So resistance to a single individual cry protein uh, doesn't confer resistance to this combined activity of all four of them. For that reason, uh, resistance to genetically modified crops, which express one or maybe even a few of these cry proteins, doesn't necessarily uh, 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 confer resistance to uh, sprayable BTs like Dicol and Zentari. <clears throat> now, the reason why these cry proteins are so important is that uh, each species has an individual susceptibility to each of these cry proteins. And that's because they have unique receptor sites, and those receptors aren't always uh, in the same quantity or also present in every insect. So, for example, uh, on the left hand side are uh, uh, some insect species. So, for example, here's the, uh, the corn earworm versus uh, the different insecticidal proteins along the top. Now, if we look at the row for corn earworm, uh, we see that it has a really susceptibility to the majority of the proteins found in Dipel, but really lower susceptibility to those found in Zentari. And so for that reason, uh, Dipel might be the better choice against an insect like corn earworm. Now, where a product like Zentari with the Cry1C and 1D really excels is against more difficult to control pests like armyworms and diamondback moths. Uh, armyworms, for example, like the fall armyworms, are uh, really acutely susceptible to the Cry1C and 1D, and less so to the other Cry proteins that might be found in a standard um, BT Kirstaki type strain. So really choosing the right strain for the right targets uh, can have a major impact on, um, on the efficacy that you'll see out in the field. Generally speaking, though, both products can effectively control uh, most caterpillar pests. However, uh, it's interesting to note that we, we have done some studies recently on fall armyworms, and Zentari really is the standout uh, against this particular pest. <clears throat> now, commercial BTs uh, exclusively work through ingestion. Uh, the caterpillar larvae have to eat the product and actually ingest those crystals and spores. Now, the, uh, the crystals are actually uh, specially evolved to only dissolve in the uh, high pH environment of the caterpillar gut. This releases those cry proteins, which are activated by the caterpillar's own digestive system. Uh, those activated proteins, or at this point we call them toxins, are, um, uh, will combine, will uh, bind to specific receptor sites on the caterpillar gut, and then they're uh, inserted into the membrane, causing those membranes to swell and eventually um, rupture, uh, letting all of the, um, uh, the BT spores and other microbes that are found in the insect gut uh, escape into the hemocell or the insect bloodstream. And then you'll see them sort of shrivel up and turn brown as they're um, essentially um, uh, uh, digested from the inside out. It's, it's pretty gruesome. Now this mode of action is actually uh, incredibly fast. It may be slow to kill, uh, but as you can see in this image here, uh, the feeding cessation occurs very rapidly. So this is a, uh, a lettuce feeding assay with second instar diamondback moss. On the far left-hand side is a control without any, um, uh, any insecticides added. There's a uh, Dipel and Zentari applied at one pound per acre, and then uh, Conserve, which is a, um, a spinosad-based product on the far right-hand side. In the upper right-hand side, you can see uh, the time since uh, these trays were infected. So what I want you to see is that um, if you look at the um, uh, if you look at the Dipel and Zentari trays, you'll notice that 24 hours after application, those insects are still moving around, uh, even though in the spinosad treatment um, they're they're very much dead. And why it's important to note that is that um, even though the mode of action to kill those insects uh, can be relatively slow, maybe taking uh, one to three days at most. Um, those insects have stopped feeding uh, within hours of ingesting the commercial BTs. And so this means that uh, when looking, uh, when going out to the field after an application to see if that application was effective, it's usually best to wait an extra day or two uh, before checking because you may see larvae moving around on the foliage and think that the product hasn't worked when in reality those larvae are just you know, slowly starving and not necessarily um, still causing damage to the crop. Now these, uh, these cry proteins and all of the other metabolites are so selective to caterpillar pests, to lepidopter and larvae, that um, they have uh, really an incredible um, uh, safety profile when it comes to 
pollinators and beneficial insects. Now this table here um, lists out a number of uh, beneficial insects that we were able to study uh, in, a, uh, in a particular screen. Uh, Dipel, Zentari, and Espinosis were applied directly to insects. So this is where they're, they're sprayed directly um, and they'll ingest it through cleaning themselves off. Uh, the boxes in green represent uh, something that's non-toxic so less than 25% mortality. Uh, the, the sort of uh, yellow, uh, the light yellow is 25 to 50%. And then the orange is moderately toxic, killing more than half of insects. And as you can see here, compared to spinosad, the selectivity of these commercial BTs is really um, remarkable. Um, the, uh, it, it's really green across the board. And this is because uh, these, these strains have evolved over millennia to just be so specific to caterpillar pests. Uh, and they were selected based on their efficacy against caterpillar pests. And so this means that they can be sprayed without harming um, any of these beneficial insects or uh, even pollinators. We actually, uh, there's a formulation that's available uh, called B402, which is um, uh, registered to be applied into um, uh, uh, beehives uh, when they go into storage. So we actually have uses um, for commercial BTs that are applied directly to beehives, which is pretty remarkable. Now this, uh, this, this low risk uh, profile also extends out into, um, uh, into applicators uh, with, an excellent, um, with an excellent worker safety profile. This gives uh, Dipel and Zentari a zero day pre-harvest interval. So you can effectively control pests in continuously harvested crops, uh, never interfere with harvesting a peak, uh, at, at peak value based on market trends. And also you can get back out in the field sooner with a four hour re-entry interval. And of course, uh, you folks are already used to not having MRLs, but of course there's no, uh, they leave no, Dipel and Centauri leave no chemical residues on, uh, on fresh produce uh, when it's harvested. Now these crop proteins also have a unique um, <clears throat> have a um, uh, a unique target site. Um, also uh, bind to unique target sites from any other mode of action. Uh, they're listed as IRAC um, as an IRAC group 11, uh, which are the only insecticides that target the caterpillar midbed. So unlike products like a spinosad um, with a single target site mode of action. Uh, Commercial BTs like Dipel and Zentari have this complex mode of action where um, you know, a, a lack of susceptibility to one of the components doesn't necessarily confer um, any resistance to the whole combination. And as an example here, this is a cross section of a caterpillar midgut with a uh, Cry1AC labeled with a, a red dye. And you can see that, that these, um, these Cry proteins will just coat the inside of the caterpillar stomach, causing those cells to rupture. And that's a, a really a unique mode of action that can in some cases even enhance the activity of other insecticides when used in combination. Uh, by giving those insecticides either uh, a different kind of access to the insect, uh, to, to the insides of the insect, uh, or in some cases undermining detoxifying uh, pathways. Now this is an example from the uh, University of Florida in which uh, we have cabbage plants that were uh, infested with uh, Plutella and um, so, sorry, uh, diamondback moth and cabbage webworm that had a severe resistance to the, um, the pyrethroid lambda cyhalotrin. So you can see there's barely any difference between the untreated control and the uh, lambda treated um, uh, cabbage. Treatment with Zentari in this case um, uh, really did an effective job controlling those insects and protecting yield because there's no known cross resistance between a commercial BT and any other insecticide class. A uh, full stop, it's, it's actually pretty remarkable. The mode of action is so unique that there's no known cross resistance that's been found. Now, part of this study was also to look at how to use BTs in rotation. And what we find is that when you start the rotation with, um, with Lambda, we allow those, uh, those early instars to mature into later stages where commercial BT may be less effective in controlling them. That leads to uh, more severe damage uh, and, and a definite loss in yield. However, starting the rotation with uh, Zentari or including Zotari in a tank mix uh, was more effective in controlling those resistant pests from the start, ensuring that um, 
that yield was protected um, all the way through. And eventually, uh, if those insects can be fully controlled, you know, bringing back the utility of, of the pyrethrins if resistance is an issue. Now, Dipel and Zentari really have expansive labels um, for uh, almost all Lepidopteran pests and organic crops. Uh, the Dipel DF label, for example, has more than 80 caterpillar species that are listed. And uh, here's a list of just a few um, that are relevant to, um, to your area of the country. So we have a number of, uh, for example, European corn borer cutworms uh, and Western bean cutworms for uh, field corn and silage, as well as sweet corn. Uh, for soybeans, uh, we also have really all of the important um, caterpillar pests like podworm, velvet bean caterpillar, and so forth, and even pests for uh, wheat and cereal grains. Uh, Zentari likewise has a very expansive label for leafy vegetables, brassicas, uh, and also cereal grains like uh, army worms in um, in uh, uh, corn and uh, and soybeans. Now this is just a uh, a few of the of the insects that are listed. Uh, if you go onto the Valent USA website and download the labels for Dipel DF and Zentari DF, um, you'll basically find any use you're looking for. With so much time in the market, we've been able to produce truly expansive labels uh, that can allow for uh, use of Dipel and Zentari in almost any situation. Now, I think one thing to point out is that um, uh, Dipel and Zentari are only effective against Lepidopteran pests. Uh, sometimes there's, there's a, um, you know, talk between folks where there may be some suspected activity against this beetle or that beetle. And we've actually followed up on some of those cases, but for the most part, really in every case, um, these products are just acutely um, uh, targeted towards uh, Lepidopteran caterpillar pests. Um, they really don't have um, any other activity besides that. This reason, Dipel forms a suspension. Not <clears throat> now, once you start with a uh, with with the right strain that you need for the job, um, it's important to have uh, an effective formulation because in this case. We're working with, um, with a product that's based on these sort of insoluble things. This is spores and crystals. They, they all need to just stay and float within, within, the, um, within the tank uh, because they're not going to dissolve like, like it would um, uh, your average chemical or um, an active ingredient like azadiraxin or something like that. And so having a, a formulation like, uh, like Dipel, uh, the Dipel DF, that very quickly um, disperses in the tank um, really enhances the usability of the product. Um, even though uh, it's a solid, uh, the material flows a lot like a liquid and immediately disperses on contact with the um, uh, with water, making it easy to mix and easy to apply. Now, Dipel DF and Zentari DF are actually granulated with ingredients that actually kind of uh, encapsulates the crystals and spores to provide some UV protection. So here you can see a, uh, a scanning electron micrograph of, of one of these particles of spray dried BT. And you can see all the nooks and crannies and within all of those, those you know, blobs, that blob shape are crystals and spores that are gonna be protected from sunlight, giving us um, a, a solid three to five days in the environment of activity. There's also a feeding stimulant that's built into the formulation. So it's not necessary to, um, to add one uh, if you are. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention another unique formulation of Dipel uh, that's also sold, um, and that's uh, a, a formulation called Dipel 10G. Now, this is actually, uh, if you look into the whorl of that corn plant, uh, you'll see these, uh, these are small, um, uh, it's or organic corn grit that's coated with, um, that's coated with the, uh, the Dipel, um, uh, the, the Dipel active ingredient. And, um, these are applied um, either, uh, they, can, they can be applied aerially over the crop and they'll actually settle into the world of the plant. Uh, this, is, this works actually very uh, surprisingly effectively because as those worlds fill up with water, uh, that's where the larvae will go to, um, uh, to actually drink the water. And once they do, they'll become intoxicated with the BT. So it's a really interesting, unique way of applying the BT um, uh, that gives just a, a different level of protection and uh, a different um, uh, a different method of application. 
Now, decades of experience have revealed really broad tank mix compatibility. So now I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, some, uh, some, some ideas about how to effectively use uh, Dipel and Zentari um, and also some of the, the unique characteristics. Now, uh, this, uh, this list here uh, shows um, uh, Dipel and Zentari data collected over, um, this is uh, from uh, as early as the 1980s. Um, I looked through all of the, the field trials in which Dipel and Zentari was mixed with uh, another active ingredient, and those are listed here. Obviously, most of them are not organic. However, it just goes to show that the, the tank mix compatibility is incredibly broad. There are a few important uh, callouts. For example, uh, copper. Uh, Dipel and Zentari are compatible with copper fungicides. However, the mixture should be sprayed immediately. Uh, if allowed to sit over the course of a day or so, uh, it'll actually start to chew into the activity of the, um, of the products. Uh, with respect to surfactants, Dipel and Centauri are compatible with um, all commonly used, most uh, commonly used uh, spreaders and stickers. However, uh, stickers are especially beneficial on hard to wet foliage like brassica. Uh, in some studies early on, we found that um, actually oils do a very good job of helping the, um, the products to stick and maybe giving them a little bit of boost of activity in some cases. With respect to lime sulfur, uh, BT products uh, should never be tank mixed with uh, lime sulfur or other uh, fertilizers uh, that are strong, um, uh, uh, strong alkaline buffers. Um, if you remember, the, the pH of the caterpillar gut is high and that's where these crystals will dissolve. So having a high pH in the tank will cause those crystals to dissolve prematurely. So uh, what we found is that uh, tank mixing with lime sulfur is, uh, shouldn't be done. And even lime sulfur applied over a BT application may reduce its efficacy. However, uh, if, you, if you do use lime sulfur, spraying BT afterwards uh, can um, uh, ensure that you maintain most of the efficacy. Now, as I mentioned, uh, Dipel and Centauri are sensitive to that high pH. However, the wettable granule formulation, uh, the, the DF formulations, can actually neutralize alkaline water sources. So if, for example, your, uh, your, your source of water has a very high pH, um, doing a simple jar test uh, to test, uh, to look at the pH before and after adding uh, Dipel or Zentari may surprise you that they actually do a good job of, of buffering the water uh, on their own without needing to add any other buffers to the mix. And finally, um, maybe not as important in, in Iowa, uh, but uh, Dipel and Zentari are compatible with peroxyacetic acid or chlorine or other water treatments uh, at water treatment rates. So that is, you know, like less than 100 parts per million, something that you could drink, um, uh, which is important, especially with um, really more strict regulations about the amount of um, uh, contaminants that can be in water sources. So using uh, treated water uh, really is no issue with um, Dipel and Zentari. And so now I'll talk about two aspects that are critical for success with um, Dipel and Zentari, or any BT for that matter. Uh, Dipel and Zentari retain their peak activity for three to seven days. So uh, it's, um, the timing is really critical. Uh, targeting early instars, uh, especially when it comes to uh, borers or leaf rollers, um, before they become inaccessible is, is really important. So if it's not already common practice, regular scouting is beneficial for all aspects of crop protection, but especially to avoid, um, but especially to, to target those timing. Even using predictive models like degree day models whenever possible to time the application as close to egg hatch as possible. And that's because those first instars are the most susceptible. This is the case for BTs, but also the case for really most, uh, most insecticides uh, on the market. So this table is actually an interesting study from uh, uh, Mato Grosso State. So this is a, uh, a University of Mato Grosso that was checking um, susceptibility of different instars to, in this case, um, this is uh, the Zentari DF formulation. Um, again, uh, here's four different caterpillar pests and 600 grams per hectare is about equivalent to half a pound per acre, uh, a relatively low rate that they were looking at. Now, as you can see across the board, uh, first and second instar larvae uh, are most susceptible to, um, to, uh, to Zentari. Once we get into the third and fourth instar, some caterpillar species like the soybean looper um, are still acutely susceptible to the product. However, um, 
most species uh, become far more um, uh, tolerant uh, when we get into the third and fourth instars. So targeting those early, um, that early application is really important for maximizing the value of, of every person. The second aspect that's critical for success with Dipel and Centauri is coverage. Because Dipel and Centauri are not systemic, uh, coverage is important to protect foliage and um, maximize the benefit of every application. Only foliage that's covered is protected. Uh, and so for best results, ensure full coverage with the lowest reasonable volume and spray until the foliage is, is dripping, but not to excess runoff. Anything that doesn't stick to the foliage um, is, is you know, product loss to the ground. Uh, in, in vegetable crops, higher volumes may be necessary under heavy pest pressure to ensure complete coverage. Uh, but really, there are um, uh, Dipel and Centauri can be used with really um, any kind of existing equipment. So application volume does have some uh, using higher volumes can be beneficial. But when it comes to um, application equipment like um, uh, ultra low volume sprayers, even thermal foggers, those application rates are going to be quite low with respect to volume, and we'll still see very good efficacy if you can get good coverage. For example, aerial applications uh, with the K in the case of Dipel DF are allowed as low as um, uh, five gallons, uh, three gallons per acre, uh, but preferably five to ten in in warmer areas. Uh, we also have done studies in the past on concentrating the materials for precision ag applications, and found that we could concentrate up to three pounds per gallon um, in a in a constantly mixed, constantly circulating environment for um, uh, on-demand application of, of a concentrated material. And so finally, I'd like to end with, um, a, uh, with um, a focus on our manufacturing plant. So actually, um, since, uh, since they were first introduced back in, I think 1972 was when the first, uh, was when the first agreement with um, A to Z drying in Osage, Iowa was, um, was written. Um, and so ever since then, uh, Dipel, Ventari, all of our commercial BTs have been formulated and distributed out of, uh, out of Iowa. Uh, back in 2016, Valent Biosciences built our own uh, standalone factory uh, to manufacture these, uh, these products um, uh, on, on our own scale. Uh, before that, they were uh, actually manufactured and they'd be grown in North Chicago, uh, loaded onto tanker trucks and then shipped across uh, to Iowa, where they would be dried, formulated, and, um, and then sold out uh, to, to be used on farms. Um, and so now uh, this manufacturing plant is right across the street from A to Z drying. And um, today, all of our products uh, from start to finish are coming out of Iowa. Uh, you know, we, we're hoping that, you know, maybe in the future, we could look at um, inviting you folks to come see it, because it's, it's pretty remarkable, commercial fermentation is uh, I think it's a truly spectacular thing to see. Uh, these are 100,000 liter fermenters uh, that are run continuously throughout the year. Now, uh, when it comes to commercial BTs, um, it, it's sort of uh, in the same way like a fine wine or a really good beer. You know, it's, it's not just the alcohol content, it's, it's the whole, uh, it, it's everything that goes into the, into the fermentation and comes out of the fermentation that matters especially when you consider that commercial BTs have this, uh, this very diverse profile of secondary metabolites, spores, different cry proteins. And so we can't necessarily just look at one of these components as a quality control check. And so every batch of Dipel and Zentari is actually tested against a, um, a live insect bioassay. And that's what you see here. Um, so uh, each of those cups has uh, a diet in which the commercial product has been incorporated in uh, at different concentrations. So we start uh, by rearing the, um, uh, the moths themselves. Uh, the moths will lay eggs on some paper that's around the outside. Those are the eggs right there. They'll be reared up to second instar larvae. And those uh, second instars will then be uh, used for testing every batch. Uh, this is really the gold standard for, for commercial BTs. And it is, um, it's rigorous enough that it ensures that um, uh, Dipel and Zentari typically have the most cry protein of any BT product on the market because we set such a rigorous standard for ourselves with this live insect bioassay. 
And so I'd like to conclude my presentation today with top 10 considerations for success with Dipel, uh, or uh, the same applies for Zentari DF. Um, we've covered most of these, but here's just a quick and, a quick and dirty top 10. So Dipel is uh, ultra effective against early instars. So targeting that early application is important. Uh, Dipel maintains peak activity on the leaf for about three to five days. So consider follow-up applications as necessary. For best results, ensure full coverage with the lowest labeled volume, because if the spray doesn't stick, uh, then neither will Dipel. Dipel works uh, through ingestion. It's not systemic, which is why coverage is so important. Uh, Dipel DF, the formulation will neutralize tank pH, allowing application with alkaline or acidic water sources, but do not mix with products that are strong alkaline buffers, because that can undermine the efficacy of the product. Dipel is compatible with most spray equipment, uh, including ultra low volume uh, applicators and um, even aerial application. Dipel formulations are expertly designed for compatibility with other insecticides, fungicides, and, and really most tank mix additives that you can think of. Dipel has uh, some rain fastness once dried. Uh, you want to avoid applications in spotty weather, though, and reapply if rain occurs before it's dried. Now, Dipel can tolerate some UV light, but it helps to ensure uh, it helps to ensure uh, complete coverage of the underside of leaves whenever possible, and also the inner leaves to reduce that UV exposure. And finally, uh, Dipel becomes a suspension rather than dissolving in water, so settling can occur. Uh, so using continuous agitation during application is necessary. You may still see bits of Dipel floating around, uh, but it's formulated not to block nozzles or anything like that. So even if you don't see it go completely into suspension. Um, it's just the characteristic of the product uh, that they are um, less soluble than other products you may, be, you may be used to working with. So thank you so much for your attention and um, I'll leave this up for a minute and then take some questions. Yeah, thank you so much for including all those videos, Daniel. That was really helpful to see, uh, you know, some of those things in action. And then also um, wanted to ask you, uh, how many people did you guys end up hiring with your Osage plant when you guys, uh, you know, created that plant in Osage? Oh, I don't, I don't know the precise number, but I, I, I seem to think it was more than 80 people. I mean, it was a pretty significant, it takes a significant workforce. To, yeah, to keep that plant running. that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. That's pretty wonderful for like a small town Iowa community to be able to provide, yeah. provide so many jobs to your uh, local Iowa folks. So that, thank you very much for doing that. That's very exciting. And yeah, it would be wonderful to check out your facility, uh, hopefully next year. Yeah, that would be really cool. Okay, so a couple of questions have cool. come in from Margaret. Um, and she asked, um, is Zentari equally effective uh, against fall and true army worms? I, I don't know about equally effective. Um, I, I don't know if I've seen the data of them side by side. Uh, with respect to fall armyworm, uh, we've actually recently been doing a lot of work uh, with the outbreaks of fall armyworm across boy, Africa, Asia, even down into Australia. Uh, and uh, Zentari is more effective against um, armyworms, even in cases where Dipel has no efficacy at all. Um, so it's, it's actually one of the unique cases where there's really a true significant difference. Um, they both should have a uh, Zentari should have efficacy against both of these uh, species, but um, I don't know about equal um, efficacy. Okay, sounds good. Thank you for that. Uh, which, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add? Oh, no, no, I was just okay. going on to the next question. Okay, perfect. So the next, uh, next question is, also from Margaret, and she inquired about the suggested nozzle types and pressures for application purposes. Yeah, well, so with respect to um, how to apply, um, I don't have any specific uh, recommendations. Uh, that might be um, a, a question better suited for um, one of the local sales reps. Um, however, uh, what we do in general, um, what we're looking for is you know, relatively small droplet size to ensure full and complete coverage of the plant. Um, so uh, 
ensuring that you can you can get adequate coverage um, is really the most important aspect. So uh, tailoring your um, your nozzles and pressures to achieve those results uh, that's that's really what what you'd be focused on. Uh, I think there's other experts in the company that could give a better answer and more specific. Um, but one thing I do know is that um, there's no there's no maximum pressures for commercial BT. That's one that comes up sometimes. Um, we spray these through um, uh, aerial applications can be under incredibly high pressures um, and it doesn't affect the product. Okay, very good. And Margaret also commented, we look forward to a tour of the facility, which yes, that would be incredible. It looks fascinating to say the sure. least. Yeah. Um, you guys, um, are there are there any more questions? I don't see any other questions in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask the question yourself or type it into the chat box. And Daniel, you might have mentioned that, um, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but you mentioned that it takes about three days or so before uh, Zentari, um, you know, takes full effect and to reapply that product. Uh, how often then should that product be reapplied? Did you mention that? I'm sorry if I missed it. No, that's fine. Uh, so the, the product will, the effect happens within hours of ingestion. So it, feeding cessation stops quickly. Um, it, uh, um, it may take a while for the caterpillar to actually die, um, but they'll stop causing damage right away. Um, uh, and so it's recommended that um, in vegetables, for example, um, seven to 10 day intervals might be, um, uh, might be required, but it depends a lot on, um, on the specific case. Uh, but sure. seven to 10 days is often recommended. Sure. So it's basically more like case by case basis. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Seven days is usually pretty good. There's a question about. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thomas says, explain what lepti, mm -hmm. Leptidoptera insect is. Yeah. Yeah. So Lepidoptera is a uh, moth and butterfly. Uh, and so uh, Dipel and Zentari are exclusively um, uh, lethal to. To the larval stage, so that's the caterpillars. So any caterpillar pest that you see crawling around on the plant uh, can be controlled by, um, oh, I should say almost any caterpillar pest could be controlled by a BT, um, but only caterpillars. Um, any other insects, either in the soil environment, um, even other beetles that might be chewing on the foliage will not be, uh, they won't even be touched by a commercial BT like Dipillars and Tari. So it's only um, caterpillars um, that will eventually turn into moths. Yeah, so it, it, it sounds like you kind of answered Kara's question about um, the effects on beneficials. Correct. Yeah, and there was, um, I mean, yeah, you can, you can, you'll be able to see it in the presentation when it's released, but um, we did have that table of um, an interesting study we had done with a company in Europe that just has a massive quantity of different types of beneficial insects. And even when applied on top of these, these beneficials, um, they really have, you know, little to no effect on, um, on anything. They're really, it's, it's truly remarkable how specific they are just to caterpillars. Um, and yet they have efficacy across almost all caterpillars. So it's, it's just a, a really cool, interesting um, uh, insecticide. For sure. Yeah, very cool. Thomas said, thank you for the response. Kara. Sure. Well, hey, thank you all for your. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Kara, is that a sufficient response or are you looking for more information there? <laughs> probably, probably good. All right. Well, you guys. Uh, yeah, she said, yeah, that was great explanation. Um, Thomas has another question for you, Daniel. He said, are there any common caterpillars that cause us problems that it doesn't control? Yeah, so the limits of commercial BTs uh, is the fact that they work through ingestion. So uh, caterpillars that, um, that will bore into the plant or even that are born in the plant, um, commercial BTs can't control. 
So there's like a, a rice borers that we can't touch. Um, there's the interesting case of um, uh, the uh, the apple pest, um, the codling moth, where the insect will be born on the outside of the uh, of the apple, and then eventually bore inside. And so in that case, we have um, you know decent efficacy because in most cases they'll eat enough uh, before they enter the the plant um, to to be controlled. But any insect that's either born inside of the plant or bores immediately without eating uh, any of the outside foliage is where we can't control them. Okay, that's a good question. That would also go for leaf rollers. Yeah, leaf rollers once they're inside is is untouchable. Yeah. Okay, that makes good sense. You guys, um, feel free to type in your final questions here. Uh, in the meantime, I'll, I'll do a couple of announcements. So, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for this wonderful webinar. And, and I, I've learned a tremendous amount about your products and how they, uh, you know, how they work. So I'm sure everyone else has too. So that's pretty cool. Um, what, what I'll do, you guys, is I will um, follow up with everyone that RSVP to this meeting with a recording that will be listed on our uh, YouTube channel that you can uh, circle back and watch again if you need to. In addition, I will have a survey that I will send your way if you guys could please take five minutes of your time to uh, fill out that survey, that would be extremely beneficial. We use your survey responses for grant reporting purposes. Um, so they are very, very important to us. Um, in the meantime, Thomas said, uh, thank you, a very good presentation. Agreed. Um, yeah, if there's any final questions, we have a couple of minutes left here. Otherwise, um, we can, you know, we can move with our day. <laughs> Margaret. All right, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yeah, Margaret said, thank you, Valent and IOA. Yeah. Excellent. All right, well, Danielle, thanks again. And uh, everyone else, thank you for being part of this webinar today. Have a good day, guys. All right, have a good day. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.